Intel's 13900K Raptor Lake is finally here, and today we're going to be running the gaming benchmarks at both 1080p and 4K. And we're going to be comparing it versus the 7950X Ryzen 9 from AMD, as well as the 5800X3D, and also the previous generation from Intel, their i9-12900K. So let's waste no more time and get straight into the facts to see how this thing performs, and then we'll move on to some productivity benchmarks right after that. So the first benchmark to pull up here is CSGO 1080p on the lowest settings possible. Here is where the i9-13900K scored a sizable victory over the other CPUs in this race. And the main reason for this is because those CPU cores are now clocking, at least in the testing I was doing here, up to 5.5 gigahertz, all cores while you're gaming. So it's an absolute huge boost over the previous generation i9-12900K. Though moving over to 4K max settings, here is where we really saw not much of a difference at all. And we did also do today's test with an RTX 4090s. And so this is the behemoth of behemoth graphics cards that we are using in today's test. And we've also decided in today's video to use 6800 megahertz CL34G skill memory on a Z790 platform for the 12th and 13th gen CPUs. And then on AMD's side, we used an X670E and also a B550 motherboard. Moving over to F1 2022 here with 457 average FPS. Now I had to rerun this benchmark because the FPS was going way above anything else. And what I realized here is when I first started testing, there was a setting in Windows called Core Isolation. Now for benchmarking on Windows 11, you should make sure this setting is turned off. Though under the 4K numbers, even with the RTX 4090 and max settings, we're not really seeing a benefit to really using one CPU over another here. So basically if you've got your 12th gen CPU, or you've got a Zen 3 on the Ryzen architecture at 4K, then you don't really have to upgrade your CPU if you intend to play games at 4K. Moving on to Far Cry 6, here's where Intel is flexing yet again with some chart topping performance, 220 average FPS versus the next best contender at 186 average FPS. Now over the 12900K, this is a massive leap in performance as well. And this is due again to that massive bump in clock speeds, plus as well that 6800 megahertz CL34 is really allowing the 13900K to work its magic. Then moving on to 4K on Far Cry 6, we did see a little bit of a difference, but nothing as major as the 1080p results. And if you're wondering about Shadow of the Tomb Raider, here's where we got some numbers that I have never seen before, both on AMD and Intel's side of the fence, where the 13900K came out with 320 average FPS at 1080p, lowest settings on DirectX 12, and then the 7950X, that got close to 300 FPS as well. So some very impressive figures in this game. The move over to 4K showed that if you guys like eating, then this would be the equivalent of eating a nothing burger. The last title we've got in the gaming benchmarks is Horizon Zero Dawn, and this is a favorable benchmark for the AMD CPUs with the 7950X delivering some chart topping performance. Now with this core isolation setting in Windows 11, this also benefited the 7950X and the 5800X 3D. So you wanna make sure this is turned off and we did get a big bump in FPS in this title in particular, as well as Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Though when it comes to 4K on Horizon Zero Dawn, there's really nothing to see here. Though if you're wondering about synthetic performance, when it comes to gaming, this is where I tested Fire Strike Extreme. And here is where we're looking at 52,640 points, beating the next best contender, the Ryzen 9 7950X. So there's the raw gaming FPS numbers. But now we're gonna talk about gaming and power consumption, which is something that I find very important when it comes to testing CPUs. And here's where you'll notice in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, this is where I had to rerun tests, especially with the 4090, the 13900K can use up to 150 watts just at 1080p lower settings. So if it's pretty much going all out, it's going to be using the power in games. 
The 7950X out of the box with its default settings is pretty bad as well, though you can undervolt that and get some massive benefits. And you can also undervolt the 13900K too as well, and that will get some benefits, but not anywhere near as much as the 7950X can. And speaking of undervolting, here's where we went a little bit more in depth with undervolting, and I do recommend it on the 13900K, just like the 7950X and also the 12900K before it, because we can drop the power consumption down. But in this case, we're dropping down the clock speeds to a 4.9 gigahertz maximum all core clock. And what this is doing, at least when we use the XTU or the Intel Extreme Tuning Utility software, it's still keeping that single core clock at its maximum, which is reported to go up to 5.8 gigahertz, which I'll pull up the clock speeds for you guys right now. But it's actually, I believe, giving out a true 5.5 gigahertz because that's kind of where it was hovering around when I was doing these tests. So even though Intel's saying it's going up to 5.8 gigahertz, I actually didn't see it in the raw numbers when it came to materializing benchmarks and also from the initial tests that i'm doing with the 13600k seems to be the same behavior where intel's pretty much just going with an all core clock out of the box even though they say they've got 5.8 gigahertz but if you decide to take the core speeds down to 4.9 gigahertz then what will happen here is that you will get lower power consumption but i find also with the undervolting we dropped it down to minus 115 millivolts but after that we just didn't see any benefit and also the system was pretty much impossible to crash, even going down to as low as minus 250 millivolt. It just didn't make any sense. It's almost like the 13900K, at least with 13th gen, the CPUs have this sort of auto brain installed in there and they manage the behavior of the CPU to make sure it's not crashing at all. And now to further provide some proof of this behavior, here's where we tested also Apex Legends on low settings at 1080p now this pretty much just goes to 300 fps and what the cpu was doing in this particular benchmark was that it was dropping the power consumption actually considerably lower than say shadow of the tomb raider and it also responded quite well to undervolting so in simple terms this is a cpu that will run more efficiently if the workload or the demand on the cpu isn't there which is a good thing if you don't like tuning your cpus at all so if you're spending over $650 on a CPU, then you're probably going to wonder how does it perform like a workstation CPU. So we'll pull up some productivity benchmarks here, starting with Geekbench 5. And here's where Intel took back the crown with a massive score of over 25,000 points and also scoring the lead on the single core score. Now moving over to 7-zip on the compression and decompression results, they did quite well here beating the 7950x in compression but then losing in the decompression numbers but regardless it is great to see these cpus trading blows because it means competition and that can only mean better advancements and better prices in the future the next up we got corona 1.3 the simulation benchmark here's where we got an even tie with the 7950x however i am going to put the i9 13900k above it since it is coming in with a cheaper msrp price so that's how i kind of rate the system rankings here when they score the same scores though onto adobe premiere pro 2022 here's where the i9 13900k at least if you want to have the igpu enabled from those optimizations that intel uses with quicksync that you can't even get on say an nvidia gpu and this enables it to score a massive victory over the 12900k and also the 7950x in this particular benchmark so if you're using adobe premiere pro definitely turn on the quick sync feature if you've got an intel cpu the next up here we've got v-ray 5 and here's where the 7950x is scoring quite a sizable victory over the i9 13900k so I, maybe this is perhaps why amd was focusing on v-ray this time around versus cinebench but one can only wonder especially with the power consumption results, which we will move on to now because they paint a very interesting picture where we'll show you guys the Cinebench R23 results first, where we can see here the i9 13900K 
is just a smidgen below at the high 36,000s versus the high 37,000 point mark. But when it comes to the single core scores, Intel does score a sizable victory here with 2,120 points versus that 1,970 points on the AMD 7950X. Though when we look at the undervolting figures, we can see here the 13900K does respond quite well to undervolting. And this is where we talked about that single core behavior before, where it does like to boost itself up again, even if you set in that manual 4.9 with XTU. However, the all core scores will take advantage of that lower power consumption and you'll really lose not much performance at all. But if we want to know what is in the watts, then this is where we go from 249 watts down to 196. So a decent drop in power savings if you want to do a little quick and easy undervolt. Though if we look at the Ryzen 9 7950X, this can get huge gains from undervolting with a minimal drop in performance. You see here going from 230 watts down to 127 as we featured in a previous video. And so when we look at this Cinebench score, AMD's always been big on Cinebench and they've always focused on it in previous generations. And here they're only winning by a slight margin, but they've had to do so at pushing their CPUs way above the limit. So they've kind of joined Intel in pushing the CPUs to the max out of the box when they can actually gain a lot more from undervolting versus the 13900K. Then what about those temperatures? Let's take a look at this graph here showing that out of the box, it'll go to 88 degrees with the same cooler that we tested on the 7950X. This is the H170i from Corsair. You see that 94 degrees versus the 88. They both run quite hot out of the box. Though if we do undervolt the 13900K, it does go down to 78 degrees. You see that with 7950X, massive drop in power consumption, but also a massive drop in temperatures. Though onto the final benchmark, and this one's very important to me personally, because I like to see if we're getting raw efficiency gains just from the architectural upgrade itself. And this is known as the IPC comparison or instructions per cycle. I like to do this in Cinebench R23 because it's simple, it's easy to get results, and it's also easy to replicate. And so here's where we saw the 12900K and the 13900K pretty much coming in with an identical score here, which means that we haven't really seen any architectural improvement in terms of raw performance with the 13900K versus the 12900K. And so this was a similar story with the 7950X versus the 5950X, where these companies are promising these massive IPC gains, but we're really not seeing anything when it comes to just running a simple Cinebench R23 test. Though with all those numbers out of the way, it's finally time to give out a recommendation that you can take home and know that you're making the right purchasing decision if you decide to get the 13900K. So straight away, who's this CPU for? It's going to be for someone who wants the absolute best gaming performance at 1080p. So an absolute pro competitive player beyond all means that needs every single FPS. But it's not going to be for someone, in my opinion, who wants to game at 4K, especially if they already have a very good CPU in their system. And also in that case, we've also got the 13600K review coming up, which I feel will be a much better pair, even for someone who wants to go with an RTX 4090. So for 1080p gaming, it's not going to be good value for money, but it is going to be the best. For 4K gaming, I believe you're just wasting your money. And also, if you are going down that route of wanting the absolute max FPS, you have to consider that there's going to be much bigger costs too. You will need a good motherboard since this CPU will chew up more power than other models out there. You will need a really good cooler and you will also probably want to go with some really good DDR5 memory like we did in today's video. So basically all those things cost quite a lot of money. Though onto the workstation recommendation and here's where you guys saw the numbers. If that's the application you use or say for instance you use one or two applications, I find most professionals will stick to one or two applications max. I stick to Premiere Pro, so I'm looking at that Premiere Pro benchmark and my next upgrade will be the 13900K in my main system because the 12900K was already the best there, but this thing is even better in terms of what it can bring, especially out of the box. But once I undervolt it too, I'll be getting better performance than my 12900K. Basically, the 13900K is a better piece of silicon or better bin if you'd like to think of it versus the 12900K, but it's also got eight more E-cores. So it's a 24-core, 32-thread CPU 
versus a 16 core 24 thread on the 12900K. It also comes with a reported markup of $10, so 560 US dollars versus 550. However, that said, you can get an i9 12900K currently for $500. Though if you are going down the workstation route, it's definitely worth paying that extra little bit of money in my opinion to go with the 13900K if that's your application of choice. So for the workstation recommendation, if it's the application you use and you can benefit and utilize those gains and it justifies the price, then it's an okay from me. Though when it comes to gaming, back to that gaming recommendation, just wait, I've got the 13600K review coming and that will be, in my opinion, a much better option for 4K gamers, but also a better option even for 1080p gamers who don't want to spend as much money. Anyhow, guys, hope you enjoyed today's review. If you did, then be sure to hit that like button. And also, if you want to see that 13600K review as soon as it drops, be sure to hit that sub button and ring that bell to get the video as soon as it's released. And also, we've got the question of the day. And this one comes from Marco, where we've actually got a very unique request here. And he asked, does the iGPU found in the 7000 series have any effect on Premiere Pro? So for this benchmark, I decided to run Puget Bench with the iGPU enabled and disabled. And the funny thing is it does show up as being recognized in Premiere Pro. However, when I did run the benchmark, it showed no benefit to having this GPU enabled. So in other words, if you're on an AMD CPU and you're in Premiere Pro, if you're on a 7000 series CPU, I would disable the iGPU as it could just cause conflicts. And basically if AMD want to get more out of their iGPU, they're going to have to optimize Premiere Pro for their driver set like Intel's done with QuickSync. Hope that answers that question and I'll catch you guys in another tech video very soon. Peace out for now.